Now, if you'll open up your big books, we'll start out first with the foreword or the preface. I don't remember. Well, one thing I wanted to point out also, if you turn the first page in your big book and you see the title where it says Alcoholics Anonymous, I want you to start grasping the fact that the word used in this program by the founders of the program is recovered, not recovering. Somebody along the line is starting to change something. It's called recovered. And the story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. It doesn't say who are recovering from alcoholism. See, what we're looking for is we're offering hope that when you go through this process, you'll be recovered from alcoholism. Does recovered mean that you can drink again? Absolutely not. It's in black and white. You're, you're granted a spiritual, you're granted a daily uh, relief from alcoholism dependent upon your spiritual condition. Now, if you'll open up to forward to the first edition. It's Roman numeral XIII. I, I think, three I's, 13. Forward to the first edition. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered. Again, it doesn't say who are recovering. It says recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. It's going to tell you how to recover from alcoholism. Now, if you will, we're going to start with the doctor's opinion. And that's on Roman numeral XXIV. When you get into the numbers, it's much easier to follow. Some people are not familiar with Roman numerals. But the, this, the page that we're going to start on is under the first uh, doctor's opinion when it says, Very truly yours, William D. Silkworth, MD. We're starting right under that. The physician, does everybody have that? It's on page on the upper left-hand corner. It's XXIV. XXIV, Roman numeral 24. You have it? Now they asked Dr. William Silkworth to put the doctor's opinion in the book. And the reason they did this is because Bill Wilson was sober for six months and no one was recovering according to the message that Bill was delivering. And when he came back to see Dr. Silkworth, he told him, and they called him Silky, he said, Silky, nobody's recovering. I'm the only one staying sober. So I believe in our history that bears out the fact that as long as you're doing work with other people, they may not recover, but you'll stay sober as a result of it. And Dr. Silkworth told Bill Wilson this, Bill, you're giving them that religion too soon. They have to understand what the problem is before they understand why they need the process of recovery. And the information that Dr. Silkworth gave Bill Wilson is now in the doctor's opinion. And that's what we're going to cover first. And the first thing we're going to try to do is understand why we need the steps to recover. And when we understand that, then it makes a little more sense as why we go through the process that we do. The physician who at our request gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms what we have suffered from alcoholic torture must believe that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, that we were in full flight from reality or were outright mental defectives. These things were true to some extent, in fact, to a considerable extent with some of us, but we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. The doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. As laymen, our opinion to its soundness may of course mean little, but as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that this explanation makes good sense. 
It explains many things for which we cannot account. Now, if you'll turn the page to XXVI, we'll start at the first full paragraph at the top of that page. We suggested, we believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol and those chronic alcoholics is the manifestation of an allergy that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. Now the first thing we have to understand is what is an allergy? How many of you people know somebody that has an allergy? What happens? What, what allergy do you know about? Speak of one. Sneezing, hay fever, allergic to hay, right? Or weeds or pollen. Anybody else with an allergy? Strawberries, rash and hives. We're all familiar with those types of allergies. But the allergy that we're speaking about here in regards to alcoholics is our allergic reaction does not occur unless we take a drink. So the whole basic premise of Alcoholics Anonymous begins with don't take the first drink. Because if you don't take the first drink, you will never get the allergic reaction. That is the phenomenon of craving that develops for more. Now these allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed a habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. And that's where they're talking about the progression of alcoholism. The more we progress into alcoholism, the more our problems increase. What used to be family arguments may become separation. Separation may become divorce, may become a child abuse, a lot of things. It just starts piling up on us because people get discouraged with us. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. What's frothy fo uh, emotional appeal? Foaming at the mouth almost. You're foaming at the mouth, pleading, stop drinking. <coughs> the message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people, you can underline this, must have depth and weight. And go to 90 meetings in 90 days is not a message with depth and weight. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. In other words, it's telling us from the very beginning, we're going to have to start doing something different. We're going to have to quit relying upon willpower and start assuming the fact that a power greater than ourselves is necessary for recovery. If any feel that a psychiatrist directing a hospital for alcoholics, we appear somewhat sentimental, let them stand with us a while on the firing line, see the tragedies, the despairing wives, the little children. Let the solving of these problems become a part of their daily work and even of their sleeping moments, and the most cynical will not wonder why we have accepted and encouraged this movement. This is the beginning of AA. We feel that after many years of experience that we have found nothing which has contributed more to the rehabilitation of these men than the altruistic movement now growing up among them. Altruistic refers to unselfish. Now here comes the beginning of the chart. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Now what do they mean that we like the effect produced by alcohol? What do they mean by that? Exactly. Why does a drug addict shoot something into his veins? Because of the effect. Basically, we're starting to understand that alcohol is a drug. If alcohol was not on the market previous today and they just discovered in the laboratory the Food and Drug Administration would not allow it to be manufactured because too many side effects, all right? And ever since somebody stepped on some grapes and it fermented and turned into wine, we've had a problem with alcohol. And as strange as it may seem, people are happy that their children are not using drugs and they're on booze. We're developing a whole new attitude in our culture today. You know how this is being developed? no longer control your drinking. Now it's all right to get drunk, just have a designated driver. 
We're spreading that out through the whole community. It's all right to get drunk, just don't drive. Alcohol is a drug. That's the first thing we have to understand. We like the effect produced. Now, a lot of old timers sitting down and will tell you, I love the taste of alcohol. I love the taste of it. You can only taste one or two drinks. Alcohol has the effect on the taste buds like Novocaine on your gums. Eventually, your taste buds go dead. So you're not tasting alcohol anymore. Any alcoholic who says, I didn't drink for the effect, I drank for the taste, is denying that he's an alcoholic. Because alcoholism is presented by the founders of this program is drinking that does not occur by choice. How many of you started drinking for a uh, particular reason? Anybody in there drink because they said, when I drank, it allowed me to talk with the girls, or the girls say maybe with the boys, all right? Uh, it allowed me to dance. It allowed me to do a lot of things. That's the effect. But do you want to know something? Social drinkers drink for the same reason. They get an effect from alcohol, too. The only difference is, in the beginning of our drinking, we were drinking by choice for this effect. And somewhere along the line, after we took a drink, what happened? We developed a phenomenon of craving. That's alcoholism. Now we're losing the choice. And then you find out that later on what happens is now we're drinking even when we don't want to drink. We're having several problems and we say we want to quit and we find out we're drinking when we're not choosing to. Alcohol on the taste buds will numb them so you don't taste anymore. There's a place in Bellevue, Ohio known uh, called McLean's. It's a restaurant and they have homemade lemonade and a great big glass barrel in there. And whenever my wife and I are going through Bellevue, I stop in for a glass of lemonade. I may drink two glasses. How come I don't drink 24 glasses of lemonade? How come? No effect. All it does is quench my thirst. Now you're understanding a little bit about what happens with a social drinker who does not develop a phenomenon of craving. He drinks one or two or three drinks, maybe possibly to quench his thirst, and he shuts it off. He's not using willpower. He just doesn't get any effect from it. And some who, uh, who drink four maybe get dizzy or sick, so they cut it off automatically. When I took a drink of alcohol, you think I was quenching my thirst? I took a drink of alcohol and it became a mind-expanding chemical. As Soon as I took booze into my system, that effect was so great, and no matter what happened in my life, I went back to it. Now look what it says, and you can do this in your own book. The sensation, that's the effect. You'll find out throughout this book, Bill Wilson uses a different word to say the same thing. We're talking about men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The next word he says is the sensation. So right above sensation, put the effect. The effect, the sensation, is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. In other words, what he's saying here is, now, when we're drinking for this effect, no matter what happens in our life, it will never be because of the alcohol. It will be because of finger pointing. It's because my wife nags me. It's because I have a hard job. It's because of the weather. It's 90 degrees outside. I go into the bar room to cool off. It's because it's cold outside. I go into the bar room to get warm. No matter what's happening in our life, this effect is so elusive, just like a drug addict, all right, shooting drugs in their system, the effect is so elusive that while we know it is injurious, it's causing us harm, we cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. We will never look at alcohol as the problem. So if you understand that much, we're, we'll go on. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. What do you think they mean by that? They're telling you that unless you have alcohol in your system, you don't feel right. For an alcoholic not to use alcohol 
is like a drug addict not to use drugs. What happens to them? What happens? They don't feel normal. They need something in their system. All right? They're like uh, the transmission fluid. You got to keep that level in the transmission full. When it goes, it's not full, you got to fill it up again. All right? They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. Impunity means it doesn't bother them. After they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emer emerging remorseful, with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. That paragraph is loaded. It first starts off with saying, they are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the feeling of comfort and ease which comes at once from drinking. What have they described there? Restless, irritable, and discontented. What's the biggest question people ask when they first come in here? What is a dry drunk? Yeah, did you ever ask that question? You just explained it. See, it was right here, and you should hear the definitions I heard of a dry drunk. I said, why don't you use the one the founders use? It makes more sense. You're restless, irritable, and discontented. Now, I'm a football buff. I like to watch football games. When I wasn't drinking, I ran out of money. I wasn't in the treatment. I was sitting on a, on a chair in the, in the front room watching television, and I lived home with mommy at that time. You know, I had a few uh, things occur in my life while I was living home with mommy. And I would sit down, and I would watch two plays, and then I would get up, and I would walk to the kitchen, open the refrigerator door, look inside the refrigerator, and close the door again, and come back and sit down. I would watch two more plays, get out of the chair, walk into the kitchen, open the refrigerator door, look into the refrigerator, close the door, and come back and sit down. And after I did that six or seven or 80 times, I don't know how many, my mother asked me, she said, son, what are you doing? And I jumped up from that chair and I said, I'm taking inventory. What am I? I'm restless, I'm irritable, I'm discontented, because I don't have the booze in my system. I couldn't get any more credit. My friend came over with a six pack. I sat down in that chair and never got up again. Now is that telling you something? Not having alcohol in my system is exactly the same thing that happens to a person who smokes cigarettes and they got a whole night to go and it's about 10 o'clock in the evening and they have to be up till six in the morning and they don't have any money and they look in their cigarette pack and there's only two cigarettes left. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They're restless, irritable, and discontented. But then they say after the individual takes a drink, all right, whew, everything levels off. How many of you people use drugs also? How many of you people know exactly what they're talking about in here? Addictions are no different. See, the biggest piece of misinformation that you have is, and I, listen, I don't want to start a controversy. That's not what this is all about. But alcohol is a drug. You don't have to tell people I'm an alcoholic addict. An alcoholic is an addict. See? And the treatment process is the same. You don't go through the steps to bring God into your life any differently in a NA then you do an AA. In CA, then you do AA. In OA, then you do an AA. All this is is a set of directions in how to bring a power greater than yourself into your life. And it's going to tell you that in black and white. Most people become confused because they think they're going through this process to get alcohol or drugs out of their system. You're going through this process to bring a power greater than yourself into your life who does for you what you can't do for yourself. And it says, after we succumb to the desire again because we're restless, irritable, and discontented, that phenomenon of craving develops again, and what happens to us? We go off on a spree. Now, you've told everybody, I quit drinking, I'm not going to drink anymore, right? 
and you stay dry for a period of time, many of you have probably tried to abstain periods of time, and then went back again. Now you've got some other problems you're dealing with. Guilt, remorse, self-pity. You're dealing with some of these other issues now. Then after the, after the, the drunk, the spree, what happens? We swear again, never again for me. You know, I have to make an acknowledgement here. We have two people who went throughout the country who have done more for Alcoholics Anonymous, if, if you can say that in those terms, than anybody I've known recently. And these are these two guys who go around the country, Joe and Charlie, because they were the first ones who started putting out tapes about alcoholism and recovery. They even got into Hazleton and presented their uh, approach to alcoholism to the people in Hazleton so they understand what the big book was all about. Now it's telling us that if this happens to us, we need something to occur in our lives to help us abstain from alcohol, and they tell us a psychic change. You know what that means? Something has to change in our head, in our mind, for us to recover. It doesn't say something has to change in our body. It says a psychic change must occur, and once this occurs, these people who seem doomed recover. And that's what we're looking for in this program. On the other hand, and strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, something occurs in the mind, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol, the only effort necessary being that to require to follow a few simple what? What are the steps called here? They're called a few simple rules. I want to keep mentioning that because the steps are not only su suggestions. There are rules, there are ideas, there are a lot of things in here. So I'm going to go over to the board now, and I'm going to try to bring out a little bit of what uh, Dr. Silkworth was saying years ago. Now, AA has nothing to do with this chart. This is something to help bear out through uh, biochemical research. We've discovered some of this information. Now, what I'm pointing out to you on a board is also on that chart. So if you can't see the chart, follow along with me. What we find out is alcoholism is listed here as a disease. Now, supposing you put a hyphen between the S and the E, and you separated the, that, what would you have? Disease. Disease is a disease, all right? We understand today that it's physical, and it's mental. In other words, there's two areas of us, that, uh, parts of us that are affected by this disease of alcoholism. And uh, it's physical and it's mental. But the unique thing that we have to understand about this is for every 10 drinkers, one is now or will become an alcoholic. Not all people who drink are alcoholics. One out of 10, does not drink safely or he is at this ease, nine drink safely, they are at ease. And strange as it may seem, when we've had problems with alcoholism and all of the court issues, domestic re uh, re uh, relations problems and everything else, who are the people that have designed the recovery programs for us? They are usually in the nine who drink safely and are at ease. It wasn't until Alcoholics Anonymous came that they understood that one drunk working with another understands it a little better because most people who are in this category think we're nuts. I was starting to believe it myself. And some people still think that. <laughs> All right? But nine drink safely. Now here's what the breakdown of alcohol, how it occurs in our system. When a person takes a drink of alcohol into their system, the taste buds automatically send signals to the brain and says he has alcohol in his system. Same as if you eat some beef. If you eat some beef, it says there's beef in the, in the 
system. That's what the taste buds are for. And it sends a signal to the brain and it says, send out the juices, the chemicals necessary to metabolize or digest beef steak. And it sends down the chemicals and we go through a digestive process. When you drink alcohol, chemicals come down from the brain to metabolize alcohol and it's through enzymes. Now these people who drink safely, all right, have enough enzymes to metabolize alcohol properly. Some people don't. It can occur early in your life and it occur later. But something happens here. Now when these chemicals hit alcohol, the first thing that happens is they turn alcohol into acetaldehyde. That's the first process they go through. And there are some people who say they used to mix it with dopamine and develop tetrahydroisoquilaline. That's the THIQ theory. They've set that aside for a while now. We're going to keep it more simple. From acetaldehyde to diacetic acid, from diacetic acid to acetone. From acetone to a simple carbohydrate composed of water, sugar, and carbon dioxide. And to get this amount of uh, liquid volume out of our system, what do we do with the water? Urine. And if you don't uh, urinate while you're drinking, oh, what do they say? He has a <laughs> hollow leg, wooden leg. See? <coughs> Sugar, which is calories. Your, 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 your uh, system will take the sugar and develop calories out of uh, alcohol. They're dead calories. See? Vitam There's no vitamins or amino acids in it. All you'll do is get calories. And a person who's in the extreme case of alcoholism may be a very tall, slim person with a protruding prot belly, almost like somebody starving. He's going through what's known as alcoholism beriberi. All right? And carbon dioxide. How do you get rid of car the alcohol? Through the lungs, right? Why do they have you take a breathalyzer test? Because you're breathing alcohol out of there, all right? Now this occurs in the average individual with about eight ounces of beer per hour, three ounces of wine, and one ounce of whiskey. The average individual can eliminate that much alcohol out of their system. If you drink more than that, it's flowing through the whole body. Now, what we understand is if you eat a little before you drink or some things like that, uh, you can slow the process down. But on the average, if you take a drink at 7 o'clock in the evening, say you drink a bottle of beer, how many ounces in a bottle of beer? Twelve? You can get rid of eight ounces of that, so you have four left over from a bottle of beer if you drink it in an hour. If you drink three bottles of beer, and that's 36 ounces, and you can only get rid of eight, what's going to happen to you even if you're not drunk? You've learned how to tolerate alcohol. Police stop you. What's going to show on your reading? You're going to show a blood alcohol level content of maybe 20. And you're going to tell the policeman, I'm not drunk. He's going to look at the reading. <coughs> and everybody's going to deny it. He said all he had was three beers. It doesn't matter. Your body can only get rid of eight ounces. You drink three shots of whiskey. You can only get rid of one. What happens to the other two? They're in your system. And you can drink all the coffee in the world and take all the cold showers and do all the jogging you want. You're not going to increase that. That's all your body is able to get rid of. So what happens uh, if you drink like so many uh, teenagers go to parties and they have what kind of parties? Chugging parties. See? And if you start drinking 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 bottles of beer an hour, or you start drinking a, a half a pint of whiskey in an hour, what happens through all that alcohol that's in your system? It's flowing through the body and it's retaining acetone. Now acetone is a chemical that destroys body tissue. And that extra acetone in the system starts attacking your body and the first two organs it attacks is the liver and the pancreas. The liver and the pancreas are the same organs that manufacture the enzymes that metabolize alcohol. So what you're saying here is if you start putting large quantities of alcohol in your system, you may affect your ability to metabolize alcohol normally. 
see most people who start drinking alcohol are on this side of the line they're able to metabolize alcohol they don't have a problem how many of you people remember getting drunk intentionally I did when I started off that was the thing to do get drunk I don't know too many teenagers if you ever ask them how much they had to drink and they're talking to another teenager who say two or three if they're anything like me they say 30 35 40 it was important to drink a lot it's only after you develop a problem that you start lying about the quantities and decreasing them the state patrolman said to the judge one day he said judge I don't know why liquor companies uh, sell six packs the judge said what do you mean he said nobody ever drinks over two <laughs> right did you ever hear the story of the fellow who took a pick uh, cucumber and he put it into the brine and somewhere along the line that cucumber turns into a pickle he don't know when but we know one thing for sure that cucumber that pickle will never again be a cucumber well that's what happens to people who are on this side of the line the people who drink safely and can metabolize alcohol once they cross over this line and now that one who does not drink safely he's at disease he's developed alcoholism when he takes a drink of alcohol now he has enzymes of insufficient quantity and quality to to metabolize alcohol what happens to this man now he, ta he turns it into acid aldehyde diacetic acid but he retains an acetone level he can't turn it into the simple carbohydrate and when you retain that acetone and you've crossed over this line when you take a drink it sets off a craving for more acetone and the mind knows how to get it to you drink alcohol here comes a guy sitting in a bar room drunk you don't know how he's lifting the glass and drinking anymore and he falls off the bar stool and he hits his head on the concrete floor and he splits it open and everybody's fearful for him and they run and they pick him up and say can I help you he says yeah get me another drink he's not doing that because he's goofy he wants to see how much he can drink he's drinking because he has a craving beyond his mental control his body's telling him to give me more give me more so this guy who's crossed over this line now makes a decision that he's never going to drink alcohol again exactly like he said but he becomes restless irritable and discontented all right he takes another drink and he goes through the cycle how many of you people can identify with the cycles in your life where you tried to quit drinking all right you know a lot of people who don't understand alcoholism and we're gonna bear this out as we go through the book think that an alcoholic has to drink every day that's erroneous you know I have a lot of my good Catholic friends who go to their grave because of a season every year called Lent and for 46 weeks out of the year everybody is telling this person you have an alcohol problem you're an alcoholic and he says no Lent is coming up I'll prove to you I'm not an alcoholic I won't drink during Lent and for six weeks that individual gives up drinking alcohol look out for Easter Sunday the first thing he's gonna do is he's gonna come back Easter Sunday and say now am I alcoholic I didn't drink for six weeks people who are not informed about alcoholics or alcoholism automatically assume an alcoholic can do this so they no I guess not here's your test and this is the test that's suggested in the big book of AA if an individual comes up to you and says I want to prove to you I'm not an alcoholic I won't drink for six months tell them no I want you to drink only two drinks a day for six months what do you think the alcoholic will tell you absolutely not it's all or nothing for me he already knows the only way he can stay clean is not to use anything at all already he knows it that's why he has to go into a period of complete and total abstinence who knew about the first drink long before AA the bartenders <laughs> no matter how you swore up they always gave you the first one free right <laughs> then they had you now after the guy goes out and he slips now he's filled with guilt remorse resentment self-pity and fear 
These are the conditions we're dealing with as alcoholics in recovery. All right? Now, does this have to happen? Does this have to happen by increasing the amount that you drink? Do you have to over drink to become an alcoholic? No, because alcoholism is progressive. It occurs in the body naturally also. Some people may drink alcohol for 25 years before they develop a problem, may never be to jail, never miss a day on a job, never get divorced. But through the aging process, as you get older, and I haven't experienced that yet, but someday I will. As you get older, your rate of metabolism decreases. You wouldn't believe it, but this beautiful body that you see here was more beautiful 10 years ago than it is now. And I eat about one third of what I used to eat. But what has happened to me? My body metabolism has slowed down. So they tell me to do what? To increase it. The only trouble is I don't have the energy anymore. All right? <laughs> but we don't know how to do that with alcohol. Let me give you an example. Because this question comes up so often. How can a priest be an alcoholic? He has God, spirituality, and, and all this education. Well, I'll tell you how. They have a ceremony, a ritual that they go through daily, where they consecrate a chalice of wine as the blood of Christ. And they drink this wine. And for 25 years, the priest drinks that wine with no problems. But somewhere along the line, he starts losing is the rate, the, the metabolism rate, the ability to metabolize alcohol. And he finds out now, when he drinks that wine, he comes from mass in the morning, and the housekeeper says, Father, do you want breakfast? He says, no, I don't want any breakfast. And he goes up to his bedroom, and he closes the door, and he opens up a drawer, and he takes out some booze, and he starts drinking. Is that priest becoming immoral? Has he lost his faith in God? No, he's developed alcoholism through the natural aging process. And uh, they have treatment centers for priests. And strange as it may seem, it took an awful long time after Alcoholics Anonymous was developed for those priests who develop alcoholism to get special dispensation from Rome to allow them not to use wine during the service. They use what? Grape juice. And after treatment, now they're able to go in and use grape juice and not develop that phenomena craving after a drink. See? And if we start understanding that this thing is physical, we start understanding more what happens to people. Our behavior is not intentional. Why do you think so many people dislike the alcoholic? Why do you think so many Why I, I have to speak of the uh, female gender because I'm more familiar with it. Why do you think so many wives hate their alcoholic husbands? Exactly. They think it's intentional. Failing to understand that once a person sedates his brain, his powers of reasoning, judgment, and inhibitions become almost uncontrollable. They're not there. Now, this is an emotional barometer. It's not a picture of my belly. It's an emotional barometer. <laughs> and we all have emotions, right? And a lot of emotions go out of whack. And what we find out is some of these conditions and other conditions, if we don't know how to treat them, all right, can get out of whack, and the idea will come to our mind to drink alcohol. So we go through a process to bring a power greater than ourselves and start changing our life actions, our emotions become a little controllable. But let's, let's look at this in regards to addictions. A person gets up in the morning, and they're restless, they're irritable, and discontented. And they find out when they go to the refrigerator, and they bring out a piece of pie and ice cream, and they eat piece of, piece of pie and ice cream, and they get that sugar into their system, how do they feel? Yeah. Better. The next time they become restless, irritable, and discontented, what's their brain going to tell them? Go to the refrigerator and what? Exactly. Now another guy, when he's restless, irritable, and discontented, he finds out if he smokes a joint, he relaxes, what's going to happen to him? Every time he feels that way, what's the brain going to tell him? 
Sure. Now the guy who's a gambler. And every time he's restless, irritable, and discontented, he goes to the track, say, and he gambles. What is he addicted to? The winning and the losing? Yeah. What? Yeah. No. Yeah. Biochemical research has discovered that in the compulsive gamblers, they find out that when they gamble, a chemical flows through their body. What is that chemical? Adrenaline. He's hooked on the adrenaline his body develops. So he goes to the track, he's losing $500,000 and everybody's sitting down looking, can't you understand we're going bankrupt, stay away from the track. He says, okay. But he sits down, he's restless, he's irritable and discontented. What does his brain tell him? Go gamble and he gets the, then he feels better. You see how addictions are formed? Now, we know this much to be true. Any individual, when they take a drink of alcohol, and physically they can't metabolize it, all right, is now powerless. And when he doesn't use any alcohol, he finds out he's left with a can't quit obsession. You've discovered the basis for a first step of Alcoholics Anonymous, the roots of being powerless over alcohol that our lives have become unmanageable. Because what happens is if you go to a hospital, what can they do for you over here? They can detox you. And once you're detoxed, there's no more alcohol in your system. What more treatment is there if that's all there was to it? If there was none of this, you would be well, you would be normal, right? But strange it may seem, after a person is detoxed, what does the program of Alcoholics Anonymous treat? Right here, the can't quit obsession. If a person has a headache, and every time they get a headache, they take an aspirin, and they find out from taking the amount of aspirin that they do, they're developing ulcers in their stomach, and there's nothing else he can use for his headache. They tell him, look it, you have to give up aspirins. It's eating your inside out. The guy says, okay. So he doesn't take any aspirins. And about two days later, he gets a terrific headache. You got nothing more to offer him? What's he gonna do? He's going to go right back to what works. He's going to take the aspirin. When a person quits using alcohol or drugs, they're not using it anymore because they know this is true in their life. If they start using, they can't stop. But the can't quit obsession is over there telling them you're going to feel better if you use. You're going to feel better if you use. You better find a substitute for them. You better give them something beside aspirin. And when this individual quits using, you have to give him a substitute to make him feel as good as the chemical did. What is that substance, that uh, substitute we refer to in AA? God, a power greater than ourselves. Let me give you one more example about addiction, and, and maybe you'll understand better what I'm talking about through the aging process. My wife and I would take the children when they were younger to breakfast in the morning especially on the weekend, Saturday, you know, when they were out of school. And the reason we did this, it was, it was a meal that we could afford. To take them out to dinner was too expensive. They would want shrimp and everything, you know, <laughs> just because they were in a restaurant. So we took them to breakfast. We could afford that. And one morning after, my, after we ate breakfast, my wife became violently ill. I was ready to call the rescue squad. No, just take me home. I'll be all right. We took her home. And about three hours later, she recovered. She said, I don't know what was wrong with me. The next week, the following week, we went to the restaurant, we ate again, and she became violently ill. We took her to the doctor and he put an allergy patch on her and found out at the age of 40, she became allergic to eggs and dairy products. For 40 years, she had no problems with it. 40 years later now, she cannot eat eggs or dairy products. The only difference between her and the alcoholic is she doesn't have a can't quit obsession that says she has to eat eggs and drink milk. So she can stop, right? What happened? Through the aging process, exactly what I told you could happen here to an individual. We may start off with an ability to metabolize alcohol and through the aging process we start losing that. And that's how our alcoholism develops. We're not immoral. 
you know, we're not bad people. That's what's meant in there when they say we're not bad people getting good. We're sick people getting well. We're starting to deal with this can't quit obsession. Now, what does that mean? If you leave here and you go out and you get drunk, you can justify it by saying, hey, I went down to the Jesuit retreat house on a weekend and Finley told me I can't help it, I got a disease. No. Once you know you have this disease or this illness and you know what the solution is, it's your responsibility to do it. If you don't do the solution, then you're responsible for your disease. You can't use that as a cop-out. I just want to read one story out of this book We're still where we were previously. A few simple rules. XXVII, 27, in the doctor's opinion. Men have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appeal. Doctor, I cannot go on like this. I have everything to live for. I must stop, but I cannot. You must help me. Some people cannot just take the first step, be honest about it, and quit drinking. If that was the case, we would have never needed 12 steps of AA. Faced with the problem, if a doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Although he gives all that is in him, it often is not enough. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. It's telling you willpower is not going to do it something more than human power. Though the aggregate of recoveries resulting from psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit we have made little impression upon the problem as a whole. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. I do not hold with those who believe that alcoholism is entirely a problem of mental control. I have had many men who had, for example, worked a period of months on some problem or business deal which was to be settled on a certain date favorably to them. They took a drink a day or so prior to the date, and then the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all other interests so that the important engagement was not met. These men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. There are many situations which arise out of the phenomenon of craving which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue the fight. What is the supreme sacrifice? Yeah. Death. People are not killing themselves because they would rather be drunk than sober. They're killing themselves because they have no alternatives. They're so confused and baffled by alcoholism, they commit suicide. The rates of suicide increase with alcoholic, alcoholism. Now, this next paragraph is going to tell us that not all alcoholics are the same. There's different kinds of alcoholics. Let's cover this paragraph. The classification of alcoholics seems most difficult and in much detail is outside the scope of this book. There are, of course, the psychopaths. That's number one, the psychopaths, who are emotionally unstable. We are all familiar with this type. They are always going on a wagon for keeps. They are over-remorseful and make many res resolutions but never a decision. That's the first kind of alcoholic. Here's the second type. There's the type of man who is unwilling to admit he cannot take a drink. He plans various ways of drinking. He changes his brand or his environment. That's number two. Here's number three. There's the type who always believes that after being entirely free from alcohol for a period of time, he can take a drink without danger. What kind is that? Periodic. There's periodic alcoholics. They're the most difficult to work with in AA because they'll go through the whole process like as if they're doing a program and six months later they're drunk again because that's when the psychic change has to occur. If it doesn't, he's back to drink again. Now here's number four. This is the kind that causes an awful lot of confusion in AA. There is the manic depressive type who is perhaps the least understood by his friends and about whom a whole chapter could be written. These are the guys who are going to come in, take lithium, uh, some chemicals for their mind, and they're legitimate if they're a real manic depressive. The only problem we have in the field of alcoholism is 
There's about 5% of that population in AA. All right? Out of every 100 alcoholics, about 5% of them may be manics or, or dually addicted. Most alcoholism programs have been designed to treat the other 95% the same way. It's the only difference. A good counselor or assessment counselor will immediately know if there's more problems than alcohol and they need more help. And uh, mental health can help a lot of people who have legitimate problems. But in our program of recovery, and we're not trying to sell you anything, what we're saying is alcoholism is a primary diagnosis. It is not secondary, it's primary. And let's go through this. Then there are types entirely normal in every res respect. That's about 95% of the population in AA. They're normal in every respect except in the effect alcohol has upon them. They are often able, intelligent, friendly people like me. Able, intelligent, and friendly, right? <laughs> now, are all reactions to alcohol the same? How many of you have been in a bar room when you see a man who starts drinking and when he starts drinking, he starts singing. You ever meet a singer in a bar room? Oh, he's a happy guy, he likes to sing, uh, you know. And then you meet another fellow in a bar room, when he starts drinking, he becomes a dancer. He wants to dance with everybody, you know. You meet another fellow who becomes in here, he starts drinking, what happens to him? He becomes violent. That's the one most, alcoholic, uh, uh, most people refer to as the alcoholic. If you're a singer or a dancer, people put up with you. You have just as much alcoholism as the other guy. But the violent one is always in court and he's appearing before the judge in family matters, all right? Then you have the other one, when he drinks, he becomes a what? A lover. He wants to put the make on all the broads in the bar room, see? Now, all of us, no matter what our, our characteristics as far as what happens to us after we start drinking are concerned, we all have one thing in common out of the five categories, whatever our behavioral issues are or anything else, what's the one symptom we have in common? Good. What? Good. No, the one thing that we're doing here that we recognize is no matter what type of alcoholic you are, once you take a drink, you can't metabolize it and you develop the phenomenon of craving, all right? We're gonna read one more paragraph and then we'll close the first session. It's on the next page. What is the solution? Perhaps I can best answer this by relating one of my experiences. About one year prior to this experience, a man was brought to be treated for chronic alcoholism. He had but partially recovered from a gastric hemorrhage and seemed to be a case of pathological mental deterioration. He had lost everything worthwhile in life and was only living, one might say, to drink. He frankly admitted and believed that for him there was no hope. Following the elimination of alcohol, there was found to be no permanent brain injury. He accepted the plan outlined in this book. Underline that. He accepted the plan outlined in this book. One year later, he called to see me, and I experienced a very strange sensation. I knew the man by name and partly recognized his features, but there all resemblance ended. From a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck had emerged a man brimming over with self-reliance and contentment. I talked with him for some time, but was not able to bring myself to feel that I had known him before. To me, he was a stranger, and so he left me. A long time has passed with no return to alcohol. One more example. When I need a mental uplift, I often think of another case brought in by a physician prominent in New York. The patient had made his own diagnosis, and deciding his situation hopeless had hidden in a deserted barn, determined to die. He was rescued by a searching party and in desperate condition brought to me. Following his physical rehabilitation, he had a talk with me in which he frankly stated he thought the treatment a waste of effort unless I could assure him, which no one ever had, that in the future he would have the willpower to resist the impulse to drink. His alcohol problem was so complex and his depression so great that we felt his only hope would be through what we then called moral psychology and we doubted if even that would have any effect. 
However, he became sold on the ideas contained in this book. This guy became sold on the ideas contained in this book. He has not had a drink for a great many years. I see him now and then. He is the finest specimen of manhood as one could wish to meet. I earnestly advise every alcoholic to read this book through and through perhaps he came to, and though perhaps he came to scoff, he may remain to pray. That's the doctor's opinion. Now, whenever they give you an example of something or they tell you something in his book, they give you an example of it. Now, we just learned what alcoholism is, how it affects our body through the doctor's opinion. Now you're going to get an example of alcoholism and they're going to give you Bill Wilson's story. That's why he's up front. They're giving you an example of alcoholism. Chapter 1, Bill's story. We're going to talk about Bill Wilson now, one of the co-founders of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he starts out with his story when he's in the Army. And he'll relate to this later in the chapter. War fever ran high in a New England town to which we new young officers from Plattsburgh were assigned. And we were flattered when the first citizens took us to their homes, making us feel heroic. Here was love, applause, war, moments sublime with intervals hilarious. I was part of life at last, and in the midst of the excitement, I discovered liquor. Bill starts drinking in the army. I forgot the strong warnings and prejudices of my people concerning drink. In time, we sailed for over there. I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol. We landed in England. I visited Winchester Cathedral, much moved. I wandered outside. My attention was caught by a doggerel on an old tombstone. Here lies a Hampshire grenadier who caught his death drinking cold small beer. A good soldier is ne'er forgot whether he died by musket or by pot. Now that's not marijuana. <laughs> that's what they used to call the containers that they drank from. Home this warning which I failed to heed. 22 and a veteran of foreign wars, I went home at last. I fancied myself a leader, for had not the men of my battery given me a special token of appreciation? My talent for leadership, I imagined, would place me in the head of a vast enterprises, which I would manage with the utmost assurance. I took a night law course and obtained employment as investigator for a surety company. The drive for success was on. I proved to the world I was important. My work took me about Wall Street, and little by little I became interested in the market. Many people lost money, but some became very rich. Why not I? I studied economics and business as well as law. Potential alcoholic that I was, I nearly failed my law course. At one of the finals, I was too drunk to think or write. Though my drinking was not yet continuous, it disturbed my wife. We had long talks when I would tell still her forebodings by telling her that men of genius conceive their best projects when drunk, that the most majestic construction of philosophic thought were so derived. I meet a lot of people who still believe that, all right? By the time I had completed the course, I knew the law was not for me. The inviting maelstrom of Wall Street had me in its grip. Business and financial leaders were my heroes. Out of this alloy of drink and speculation, I commenced to forge the weapon that one day would turn in its light like a boomerang and all but cut me to ribbons. Living modestly, my wife and I saved a thousand dollars and went into certain securities, then cheap and rather unpopular. I rightly imagined that some would someday have a great rise. I failed to persuade my broker friends to send me out looking over factories and managements but my wife and I decided to go anyway. I had developed the theory that most people lost money in stocks through ignorance of markets. I discovered many more reasons later on. Bill went out and he started checking uh, a lot of companies out around the East Coast and down South. And if you ever saw his film, My Name is Bill W., he mentions the fact that one of them he investigated was General Electric. And he conned his way into the General Electric plant there and talked to the engineers, and he got a lot of inside information, which when he came back, they found was very useful 
and that set him up as a good stock analyst. We gave up our positions and off we roared on a motorcycle, the sidecar stuffed with tent blankets, a change of clothes, and three huge volumes of financial reference service. Our friends thought a lunacy commission should be appointed. Perhaps they were right. I had some success at speculation, so we had a little money, but we once worked on a farm for a month to avoid drawing on all our small capital. That was the last honest manual labor on my part for many a day. We covered the whole eastern United States in a year. At the end of it, my reports to Wall Street procured me a position in there and the use of a large expense account. The exercise of an option brought in more money, leaving us with a profit of several thousand dollars for that year. For the next few years, fortune threw money and applause my way. I had arrived. My judgment and ideas were followed by many to the tune of paper millions. The great boom of the late 20s was seething and swelling. Drink was taking an important and exhilarating part in my life. There was loud talk in the jazz places uptown. Everyone spent in thousands and chattered in millions. Scoffers could scoff and be damned I made a host of fair weather friends. And this is what happens to a lot of people who develop alcohol and addiction problems. They not only become addicted to the chemical, but they become addicted to their lifestyle and their environment. And that's why sometimes you have to take people out of the environment to get them well. That's one of the big jobs, uh, chores that uh, halfway houses and three-quarter houses have, try to keep them out of the environment, relocation. My drinking assumed more serious proportions, continuing all day and almost every night. The rem remonstrances of my friends terminated in a row and I became a lone wolf. In other words, people are starting to stay away from Bill Wilson. It happened to me, it might have happened to some of you. It happens to some people even without alcohol. <laughs> there were many unhappy scenes in our sumptuous apartment. There had been no real infidelity for loyalty to my wife helped at times by extreme drunkenness kept me out of those scrapes. In 1929, I contracted Gulf fever. We went at once to the country, my wife to applaud while I started out to overtake Walter Hagen, who was a noted golf professional at the time. Liquor caught up with me much faster then I came up behind Walder. I began to be jittery in the morning. Golf permitted drinking every day and every night. It was fun to caroom around in the exclusive course which had inspired such awe in me as a lad. I had acquired the impeccable coat of tan one sees upon the well-to-do. The local banker watched me whirl fat checks in and out of this till with amused skepticism. What's happening here is exactly what we covered on that chart. Bill Wilson is starting to lose his ability to metabolize alcohol. He's starting to, to need the morning drink. It's starting to become medicine for him. Abruptly in October 1929, hell broke loose on the New York Stock Exchange. After one of those days of inferno, I wobbled from a hotel bar to a brokerage office. It was eight o'clock, five hours after the market closed, his ticker still clattered. I was staring at an inch of tape which bore the inscription XYZ32. It had been 52 that morning. I was finished and so were many friends. The papers reported men jumping to death from towers of high finance. That disgusted me. I would not jump. I went back to the bar. My friends had dropped several million since 10 o'clock. So what? Tomorrow was another day. As I drank, the old fierce determination to win came back. Next morning, I telephoned a friend in Montreal. He had plenty of money left and thought I had better go to Canada. By the following spring, we were living in our custom style. I felt like Napoleon returning from Elba. No St. Helena for me. But drinking caught up with me again and my generous friend had to let me go. This time we stayed broke. In other words, Bill is starting to lose his employment because of alcohol. It's happened to me, it's happened to many others in this room. And we have to recognize this. Alcoholism is progressive. We went to live with my wife's parents. I found a job, then lost it as a result of a brawl with a taxi driver. Mercifully, no one could guess that I was to have no real employment for five years or hardly draw a sober breath. My wife began to work in a department store, coming home exhausted to find me drunk. I became an unwelcome hanger-on at brokerage places. Bill's alcoholism is coming to the point 
you can't hold employment. Lois is taking a job. Some people today would consider that enabling. They would say you're enabling the alcoholic to drink by taking employment. Uh, some people are dedicated to their family. No matter what you call it, it became a necessity as a result of his alcoholism. It became the necessity of a lot of families, maybe possibly some in this room. Liquor ceased to be a luxury. Not drinking now for recreation. He's not drinking with society. It became a necessity. It's now medicine. Bathtub gin, two bottles a day and often three, got to be routine. Who knows why they call it bathtub gin? Who knows what that is? Sure, prohibition was on. They were brewing uh, whiskey in their bathtubs at home. I'll give you an example of how we've come uh, uh, full circle. About the time this book was written, if a guy was caught drinking, what happened to him? Went to prison or selling it. If a guy was caught smoking pot, what happened to him? Misdemeanor, misdemeanor charge. Today we've come full circle. We've accepted alcohol and made drugs illegal. Now if a guy's using drugs, he goes to prison and drunk is all right. We have double standards. Sometimes a small deal would net a few hundred dollars and I would pay my bills at the bars and delicatessens. I can identify with that. When I first came into the program and they suggested I make amends, the first amend I made was to the bartenders. I paid my bill. I think somewhere in the back of the mind I felt I was coming back anyway. This went on endlessly and I began to waken very early in the morning, shaking violently. A tumbler full of gin followed by a half dozen bottles of beer would be required if I were to eat any breakfast. What's he doing? Taking a morning drink medicine, a little bit of the hair of the dog that bit you. You know what that means, a little bit of the hair of the dog that bit you. Sure, that's, well, that's an old Greek uh, approach to dog bite. You know, if you want to get rid of a dog bite, they said get some hair from the dog who bit you, make a pomace out of it, and put it on a wound, and that would heal it. So they're saying a little bit of the hair of the dog that bit you means what's making you sick is going to make you well. Nevertheless, I still thought I could control the situation, and there were periods of sobriety which renewed my wife's hope. Gradually, things got worse. The house was taken over by the mortgage holder. My mother-in-law died. My wife and father-in-law became ill. Then I got a promising business opportunity. Stocks were at a low point of 1932, and I had somehow formed a group to buy. But I was to share generously in the profits. Then I went on a prodigious bender and the chance vanished. Bill Wilson had no other recreation other than golf and drinking. His wife would often talk to him about getting him involved in other activities and he wouldn't do it. And he was sitting around with a group of these investors and Bill's gonna be set up to handle the, the effort. And he made one condition, Bill, you don't drink anymore. And they're playing cards there and they're passing the home uh, raisin jack around and Bill passes it up twice. And in his story he says, well, he thinks about it. One drink won't hurt him. He gets into the bottle and that's it. What occurred? The phenomenon of craving. There went his business opportunity. <coughs> I woke up. Bill says, I'm waking up. I woke up. This had to be stopped. I said, I saw I could not take so much as one drink. Bill's understanding, he's powerless. I was through forever. Before then I had written lots of sweet promises, but my wife happily observed that this time I meant business and so I did. Why? Because he's an old Connecticut Yankee, a man of his word. And he went to the family Bible and he opened it up and he wrote, I, William Wilson, swear that this day forward I shall never drink alcohol again and he did that in front of Lois and Lois when she saw him do that in the Bible said oh boy drinking is done now he's a man of his word self-will was gonna fix it shortly afterward I came home drunk there had been no fight where had been my high resolve I simply didn't know it hadn't even come to mind. Someone had pushed to drink my way and I had taken it. Was I crazy? I began to wonder, for such an appalling lack of perspective seemed near being just that. Renewing my resolve again, that means 
He's making a decision. He's not going to drink again. He's, he's going on a wagon. I try it again. Some time passed and confidence began replaced by cocksureness. I could laugh at the gin mills. They don't bother me. Guy says, I go down to the, to the bar room to drink pop. I go down to shoot pool. They booze doesn't bother me. They're staying in wet places. I go down there to get my job. That sounds like me to go and man uh, goes to a house of ill repute for a ham sandwich. I don't believe that. <laughs> now I had what it takes. One day I walked into a cafe to telephone. In no time I was beating on a bar asking myself how it happened. As the whiskey rose to my head, I told myself I would manage better the next time, but I might as well get good and drunk then, and I did. The only difficulty I had with that is it leaves you with the impression that Bill decided to get drunk. Failing to understand what we know today, all right, the alcohol is taking over on them. And a lot of times I hear people in their leads make it sound as if something occurred in their life and they chose to drink. If the situation had not occurred, if you're an alcoholic, that restlessness, irritability, and discontentment, you'll drink anyway. The remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable. What we're going to describe in here are alcoholic fears. <coughs> The courage to do battle was not there. My brain raced uncontrollably, and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. I hardly dared cross the street, lest I collapse to be run down by an early morning truck, for it was scarcely daylight. An all-night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were still at last. A morning paper told me the market had gone to hell again. Well, so had I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. That was a hard thought. Should I kill myself? No, not now. Then a mental fog settled down. Gin would fix that, so two bottles in oblivion. The mind and body are marvelous mechanisms, for mine endured this agony two more years. It's now 1934. Sometimes I stole from my wife's slender purse when the morning terror and madness were on me. Again I swayed dizzily before an open window or the medicine cabinet where there was poison, cursing myself for a weakling. There were flights from city to country and back as my wife and I sought escape. That's the geographic cure. Then came the night when the physical and mental torture were so hellish I feared I would burst through my window, sash and all. Somehow, I managed to drag my mattress to a lower floor lest I suddenly leap. A doctor came with a heavy sedative. Next day found me drinking both gin and sedative. This combination soon landed me on the rocks. People feared for my sanity. So did I. I could eat little or nothing when drinking, and I was 40 pounds underweight. My brother-in-law is a, is a physician, and through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics. What was there previous to AA? <coughs> treatment centers. Listen to the treatment. Under the so-called belladonna treatment, my brain cleared. That was a tranquilizer, similar to uh, Librium or Valium. So that was already in place for withdrawal. Hydrotherapy, that's hot and cold baths. And mild exercise helped much, and included in that was a diet. Best of all, I met a kind doctor who explained that though certainly selfish and foolish, I had been seriously ill bodily and mentally. Two-fold disease there, right? It relieved me somewhat to learn that in alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor, though it often remains strong in other respects. My incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained. Understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. That means everything's going his way. I went to town regularly and even made a little money. Surely this was the answer, self-knowledge. And you're going to pick this up again in another chapter. And you're going to pick it up again in another chapter where it repeatedly states that self-knowledge is to no avail. The psychic change that must occur for alcoholics or addicts to recover is in, through a power greater than ourselves. 
But it was not, for the frightful day came when I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. After a time, I returned to the hospital. This was to finish the curtain, it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure during delirium tremens, or I would develop a wet brain perhaps within a year. She would soon have to give me over to Undertaker or the asylum. And for those of you who are addicts other than alcoholics, I want you to understand something. It's harder on withdrawal from alcoholism on the heart than it is on withdrawal from drugs. More people die in withdrawal from alcohol than withdrawal from drugs. A lot of people don't want to believe that. They think it's more severe the opposite. It is not. They did not need to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride. I, who had thought so well of myself and my abilities of my capacity to surmount obstacles was cornered at last. Bill's coming to the first step. Now I was to plunge into the dark, joining that endless procession of sots who had gone on before. Sots were what they referred to as alcoholics or drunks. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness after all. What I would not give to make amends, but that was over now. No words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. What had Bill done? Took the first step of AA. Before he came to AA, he took the first step. If you take the first step and you're honest about it, do you stay sober? That's what some people tell you, though, in the misinformation. All you got to do is take the first step, be honest about it, and you won't drink anymore. Be careful of that individual. We're going to bring that guy out later in this book. He may kill you if you're an alcoholic. He took the first step. Trembling, I stepped from the hospital, a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Then came the insidious insanity of the first drink. What's our insanity? When we think we can drink again. And on Armistice Day 1934, I was off again. Why on Armistice Day? Bill's riding out to the golf course on a bus and it breaks down. And the man he's sitting next to on a bus, they go into a bar room waiting for another bus to come and pick him up. And the man is offering him drinks, and he's telling the man all the reasons why he can't drink. And then the bartender comes by and says, it's Armistice Day, ninth. and what does Bill's mind go back to? The war days when he was a hero, euphoric recall. And he takes the drink, and the man next to him says, you got to be crazy to drink again after what you told me. Bill said, maybe I am. That's how he got euphoric recall. Everyone became resigned to the certainty that I would have to be shut up somewhere or would stumble along to a miserable end. How dark it is before the dawn. This is the statement that most people use in AA telling you the sicker you get, the better it is for you. Do you know the people who accept this program the quickest? The sickest. The other people play around with it for a while. That's why they say the best leveler we have in this program is alcohol. You don't get AA, booze will get you and bring you back. In reality, that was the beginning of my last debauch. I was soon to be catapulted in what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. The fourth dimension of existence explains what? The 12th step. See? I was to know a fourth dimension of existence. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes, a spiritual experience or awakening. Near the end of that bleak November, I sat drinking in my kitchen with a certain satisfaction. I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night and the next day. My wife was at work. I wondered whether I dared hide a few full bottle of gin near the head of our bed. I would need it before daylight. My musing was interrupted by the telephone. 
The cheery voice of an old friend asked if he might come over. And whenever Bill says anything that's important, he gets nervous. <coughs> he was sober. This impressed Bill. You don't ever remember seeing his friend Debbie Thatcher sober. It was years since I could remember his coming to New York in that condition. I was amused, amazed. Rumor had it he had been committed for alcoholic insanity. I wonder how he escaped. And what happened is he had a big Packard, and he's drunk, and he's driving down the highway. And Ebby Thatcher is really drunk, and he comes around the curve, and he runs right into a house, and he goes through the wall of the house and into the kitchen. And the woman who's in the kitchen, she's terrified. And Ebby comes stepping out of his car, and he's drunk, and he says, Madam, I believe this is an opportune time for a cup of coffee. And they're going to lock this guy up. That's when uh, Roland Hazard and Sam Shoemaker, part of the Oxford movement, went and got Ebby out of jail and gave him the Oxford program. Of course he would have dinner, and then I could drink openly with him. Unmindful of his welfare, he didn't care that Ebby was trying to quit. He's sitting in front of him drinking. I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other days. There was that time we had chartered an airplane to complete a jag. His coming was an oasis in the dreary desert of futility, the very thing in an oasis. Drinkers are like that. I have a little story about that in one of these books here. Maybe I didn't bring it. No. The door opened and he stood there, fresh-skinned and glowing. That's Ebby. There was something about his eyes. He was inexplicably different. What had happened? See? And one thing, uh, if you ever want to understand how to read this book, whatever question is asked in this book, it answers it. If you want to know what you're reading about, look at the questions. The next pages are going to answer it. I pushed a drink across the table. He refused, disappointed but curious. I wondered what had gotten to the fellow. He wasn't himself. Come, what's this all about, I queried. He looked straight at me. Simply but smilingly, he said, I've got religion. I was a gas, so that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot. Now, I suspected a little cracked about religion. He had that starry-eyed look. Yes, the old boy was on fire, all right. But bless his heart, let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer than his preaching. But he did no ranting. Not like when I went on 12-step calls. I thought you had to sew them up and deliver them. In a matter of fact way, he told how two men had appeared in court persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. They had told of a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. The practical program of action, the six steps of the Oxford movement, similar to AA's 12 steps. That was two months ago, and the result was self-evident at work. And if you want to know where those steps are, they're on page 292 in your big book. And we'll read them to you. Wednesday in Dr. Bob's afternoon off, he had me down to the office and we spent three or four hours formally going through the six-step program as it was at the time. The six steps were, number one, complete deflation, that's powerlessness. Two, dependence and guidance from a higher power. Three, moral inventory. Four, confession. Five, restitution, and six, continued work with other alcoholics. So the format for the 12 steps was already in place in the Oxford movement. That's what they were using to stay sober with. He had come to pass his experience along to me. What experience is he going to pass along? His drinking experience? His experience of a religious program that he went through that created a spiritual experience or awakening. If I cared to have it, I was shocked but interested. Certainly I was interested. I had to be for I was hopeless. He talked for hours. Childhood memories rose before me. I could almost hear the sound of the preacher's voice as I sat on still Sundays way over there on the hillside. There was that proffered temperance pledge I never signed. My grandfather's good-natured contempt of some church folk and their doings. 
his insistence that the spheres really had their music, but his denial of the preacher's right to tell him how he must listen, his fearlessness as he spoke of these things just before he died. These recollections welled up from the past. They made me swallow hard. There was that day in old Winchester, there was that day in old Winchester Cathedral came back again. What is he thinking about? Bill's going overseas. He has fear. He's in a church in Winchester Cathedral and he says a prayer for God to help him. See, they say there are no, there's uh, no atheists in a foxhole. I had always believed in a power greater than myself. I'd often ponder these things. I was not an atheist. Few people really are, for that means blind faith in a strange proposition that this universe originated in a cipher and aimlessly rushes nowhere. My intellectual heroes, the chemists, the astronomers, even the evolutionists suggested vast laws and forces at work. Despite contrary indications, I had little doubt that a mighty purpose and rhythm underlay all. How could there be so much of precise and immutable law and no intelligence? I simply had to believe in a spirit of the universe who knew neither time nor limitation, but that was as far as I had gone. With ministers and the world's religions, I parted right there. When they talked of a God personal to me who has loved superhuman strength and direction, I became irritated and my mind snapped shut against such a theory. To Christ, I conceded the certainty of a great man not too closely followed by those who claimed him, his moral teaching most excellent. For myself, I adopted those parts which seemed convenient and not too difficult. The rest I disregarded. The wars which had been fought, the burnings and chicanery that religious dispute had facilitated made me sick. I honestly doubted whether on balance the religions of mankind had done any good. Judging from what I had seen in Europe and since the power of God in human affairs was negligible, the brotherhood of man a grim jest. If there was a devil, he seemed to be the boss universal and he certainly had me. Now all of these opinions and ideas that he's talking about God, I have heard for over 30 years in AA. I've heard all of these things. What we have to recognize is we're not here to, to uh, talk about religion and, and uh, whether God is male and female or a lot of other things. What we're in here for, if you honestly believe it, is I want to get well. And I'm going to use this process to get well. That's the factor we want to zero in on. Do you want to get well? When you want to get well, any medicine is good. When I wanted to, and I really had to, I even appreciated castor oil. You have a bellyache strong enough. But my friends, friend sat before me and he made the point blank declaration that God had done for him what he could not do for himself. His human will had failed. God has done for him what he could not do for himself. What is he saying in there? What's the second step? Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. His human will had failed. Doctors had pronounced him incurable. Society was about to lock him up. Like myself, he had admitted complete defeat. Then he had, in fact, been raised from the dead, suddenly taken from the scrap heap to a level of life better than the best he had ever known. Had this power originated in him, Bill's asking a question. Here's the answer. Obviously, it had not. There had been no more power in him than there was in me at that minute, and there was none at all. That's where we come to an AA. That's what the message is being delivered. You see, the first four chapters of this big book deal with steps one and two. You don't go into the action steps until you come to chapter five. And steps one and two are never with any directions in how you take step one or two. Because step one and two, all they give you is information to relate to are conclusions that you come to in your own mind. We most probably would like to have most people come to these conclusions before they come to AA. That's why you come ready for treatment. I admit I'm powerless over alcohol. My life is unmanageable, and I believe that a power greater than myself is necessary for me to stay sober. You come to those conclusions in your head. You don't work those steps. What's the only test you can use to find out whether you're alcoholic or not? Drink. drink. <laughs> 
It's the only way you'll find out. This is not an educational process. You find out if you're alcoholic by drinking. If you never took a drink, you'd never know. And our past, don't, don't say Finley told me to go out and drink now. You've got enough. I could tell just by looking at you guys you had enough. <laughs> <coughs> that floored me. It began to look as though religious people were right after all. Here was something at work in a human heart which had done the impossible. My ideas about miracles were drastically revised right then. Never mind the musty past. Here sat a miracle directly across the kitchen table. He shouted great tidings. I saw that my friend was much more than inwardly reorganized. He was on a different footing. His roots grasped a new soil. Despite the living example of my friend, there remained in me the vestiges of my old prejudice. The word God still aroused a certain antipathy. When the thought was expressed that there might be a God personal to me, this feeling was intensified. I didn't like the idea. I could go for such conceptions as creative intelligence, universal mind, or the spirit of nature. But I resisted the thought of a czar of the heavens However loving his sway might be, I have since talked with scores of men who felt the same way. My friend suggested what then seemed a novel idea. He said, why don't you choose your own conception of God? Why don't you choose your own conception of God? That is one of the most important facts about rehab. Why? That is the individual part of this program. The program is not individual. Your concept of a power greater than yourself is an individual choice. Nobody can tell you what that power is to be. That's the individuality of the program. And people have misconstrued that statement to say AA is an individual program. No AA is not an individual program. If you choose a rock to be your higher power, then in the third step you turn your will and life over to a rock, if that makes sense to you. And the rest of the steps are designed to bring you closer to that power and have a religious or a spiritual experience or awakening. If your higher power is a tree, that's your conception. If your higher power is, if you're a Christian, is Christ, then that's your conception. If your higher power is a, is a the Muslim God, then that's your conception. If it's Buddha, then that's your conception. That is the individual part of this program. We have various beliefs in here, but we have one conclusion, that if you follow this process, you're going to come closer to that higher power and have an experience with it. That's our belief. That statement hit me hard. It melted the icy intellectual mountain in whose shadow I had lived and shivered many years. I stood in the sunlight at last. Now, very important. Bill's nervous when he writes it. Look at how scribbly he is. <laughs> it was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Only a matter to be willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. What's the beginnings, the foundations of AA? A willingness to believe in a power greater than myself. That's all that's necessary. Doesn't say anything else. The whole basis of this foundation of recovery is based on willingness. I saw that growth could start from that point. Upon a foundation of willingness, I might build what I saw in my friend. Would I have it? Of course I would. <clears throat> Thus was I convinced that God is concerned with us humans when we want him enough. At long last, I saw, I felt, I believed. Scales of pride and prejudice fell from my eyes. A new world came into view. The real significance of my experience in the cathedral burst upon me. For a brief moment, I had needed and wanted God. Remember in Winchester Cathedral? He's going overseas. He needed and wanted God. There had been a humble willingness to have him with me, and he came. But soon the sense of his presence had been blotted out by what? Worldly clamors, environment, self-will, mostly those within myself. <clears throat> and so it had been ever since how blind I had been. See, most people who get into problems with self-will, it goes a little like this. 
Give me money, give me clothes, give me food, give me shelter, give me, give me, give me, but stay out of my life. Don't tell me where to go, when to go, who to go with, how to do it, or anything else. I'm running the show, but just give me the money necessary. Had started about 15 at home with me. Just give me and I'll do the rest. Self-will, no control. Religion, family, everything out the window. Going to live life my way. At the hospital, I was separated from alcohol the last time. Treatment seemed wise, for I showed signs of delirium tremens. There I humbly offered myself to God as I then understood him to do with me as he would. I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. What did he do there? Step three. Step three. He took the third step that night. He's come to steps one and two. He's taken the conclusions. Now he's turning his will and life over the care of God. I ruthlessly faced my sins and becoming will, be, ruthlessly faced my sins. What's that? Fourth. Fourth. And became willing to have my newfound friend take them away, wood and branch. What's that? Six and seven. All right. My schoolmate visited me, and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. Fifth step. We made a list of people I had heard or with whom I felt resentment. Step eight. I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals admitting my wrong. Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. Step nine. I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within me. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. Step 10. I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Step 11. Never was I to pray for myself except as my request bear my usefulness to others. Then only might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. My friend promised me when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator that it would have elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. Step 12. Belief in the power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. Now, this next statement is one you hear so often in the program. Now let's clarify it because you guys are going to have a lot of information with you. We don't want you to leave this facility and become like some Christians, Bible quoters. You're not just to quote the Bible, you're to live this program. And don't become a big book quoter. Well, on page 37, paragraph 2, line 6 says this. <laughs> you got to live it. One of the things, the statements you hear in this program, did you ever hear this statement? This is a simple program, but it's not easy. Did you ever hear that? Yeah. That is an incomplete statement. That statement is tied into another statement. Look in this paragraph, read what it says. Simple, but not easy. A price had to be paid. It meant destruction of self-centeredness. I must turn in all things to the Father of light who presides over us all. Simple, but not easy. A price must be paid. The price is destruction of self-centeredness. In other words, what they're telling you in here is one of the four absolutes. You've got to get out of self. You've got to start being of service to other people. If those of you that are Christian, Christians, he who loses himself, what? Finds himself. All right? Do unto others as you have what? Others do unto you. In other words, you start becoming of service to other people. These were revolutionary and drastic proposals but the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. There was a sense of victory followed by such a peace and serenity as I had never known. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted as though the great clean wind of a mountaintop blew through and through. God comes to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. For a moment, I was alarmed and called my friend the doctor to ask if I were still sane. He listened in wonder as I talked. Finally, he shook his head saying, something has happened to you, I don't understand, but you had better hang on to it. Anything is better than the way you were. Did Bill, was Bill Wilson the only one to have a spiritual experience? 
No. The good doctor now sees many men who have such experiences. Do you know why? They still believed that the steps could create this. Today, people mimic it. Oh, here comes God. I've heard him say that about people who talk about steps and spiritual experience. They ridicule them in a program today. Don't do that. There is not an individual sitting in this room this morning, male or female, who can't come in here at night or go to the chapel or be alone with another person and be sincere about the process they're going through that can, cannot have this spiritual experience. I have met several people. I have never had one. For some people, it comes slowly. It says, I took the milk train route, you know? But I can tell you, this is not the individual that came to AA standing up here. And that's what's going to happen in our lives. We're going to live differently. Quitting drinking is not the ending. That's the beginning. You must quit drinking to start working the program. Rarely have we seen a person fail who sorely followed our path. Never have we seen a person succeed who continues to drink. You must not drink to start the program. The good doctor now sees many men who have such experiences. He knows they are real. While I lay in a hospital, the thought came that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have what had been so freely given me. Perhaps I could help some of them, them and they in turn my work with others. Now, how many of you have been in treatment previously? Have any of you gone to Gorski's symptoms of relapse? Did you ever hear the symptoms of relapse? They're talking about all these relapses. AA has its symptoms of relapse that people know nothing about. And here's the first symptom of relapse, that this program tells you when you will drink if you don't do this. And let's get this down. And on the side, put on the side of this paragraph, first warning to drink. My friend had emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in all my affairs. Particularly was it imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. What's he talking about? Twelve-step work. Faith without works was dead, he said. And how appallingly true for the alcoholic. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink again, and if he drank, he would surely die, and faith would be dead indeed. With us, it is just like that. The first warning in this program tells me that if I don't become of service to others, and carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm going to drink. And it does not say, but if I'm at an AA meeting, it's all right, I don't have to do this. Now, don't leave this room saying, Finley says meetings are not important. They are very important. I'll bring that out later. But what I'm telling you also, it's giving you a program of action, and it's telling you what you're learning, you share with others. That's the first requirement to stay clean. Does a spirit, spiritual experience keep you sober? If you have the flashing lights and the wind and everything, does that keep you sober? Nope. No. It may help you confirm a belief in a power greater than yourself. You didn't ask for the quarter pass. <laughs> My wife and I abandon ourselves with enthusiasm to the idea of helping other alcoholics to a solution of their problems. I was fortunate for my old business associates remained skeptical for a year and a half during which I found little work. A year and a half sober, Bill's not finding a job. So don't think you're unique. I was not too well at the time and was plagued by waves of self-pity and resentment. Bill suffering these things. Then this sometimes nearly drove me back to drink. But I soon found that when all me other measures failed, work with another alcoholic would save the day. He didn't say get down on my knees and say a prayer to be released. He said work with another alcoholic will save the day. Many times I have gone to my old hospital in despair. On talking to a man there, I would be amazingly lifted up and set on my feet. It is a design for living that works in rough going. 
What is the design for living that works in rough going when you're tempted to use? Yeah. Does it tell you go to a meeting and it's going to leave you? No, it does not. The fellowship is a support. But when it comes to this critical point in my life where I'm deciding whether I'm going to use again, what's going to happen to me? I better go out and work with somebody else and I find out by talking to somebody else the desire to use, use alcohol leaves me. Thank you. We commence to make many fast friends and a fellowship has grown up among us among us, which is a wonderful thing to feel apart. The joy of living we really have, even under pressure and difficulty. I have seen hundreds of families set their feet in a path that really goes somewhere. I have seen the most impossible domestic situations righted. Feuds and bitterness of all sorts wiped out. I have seen men come out of asylums to resume a vital place in the lives of their families and communities. Business and professional men have regained their standing. There is scarcely any form of trouble and misery which has not been overcome among us. In one western city and its environments, there are 1,000 of us in our families. We meet frequently so that newcomers may find the fellowship they seek. At these informal gatherings, one may often see from 50 to 200 persons who are growing in numbers and power. An alcoholic in his cups is an unlovely creature. Our struggles with them are very variously strenuous, comic, and tragic. One poor chap committed suicide in my home. He could not or would not see our way of life. There is, however, a vast amount of fun about it all. I suppose some would be shocked at our seeming worldliness and levity. But just underneath there is deadly earnestness. Faith has to work 24 hours a day in and through us or we perish. Most of us feel we need look no further for utopia. We have it with us right here and now. Each day my friend's simple talk in our kitchen multiplies itself in a widening circle of peace on earth and goodwill to men. And I told you yesterday, every day an individual goes out on a 12-step call as Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob doing the same thing from the very beginning. This thing called Alcoholics Anonymous is a power. It's a gift for those who want to accept it. There are some people, I, I believe it's something like they say that only one out of every 37 people who need it will get an opportunity for treatment and AA. Only one out of 37. We're still only scratching the surface. But if you believe you want a new way of life, you can see what happened to one of the co-founders. It can happen to you also. We're going to break now.